Okay. Um, can I thank everyone for joining in on this BAC webinar, which um, is going to be about the use of digital pathology in cytology and uh, to our two speakers, which I'll come on to in a moment and thank them for agreeing to speak. Um, there's a couple of housekeeping rules. I don't know if you can share that screen, Christian. Um, just to say if everybody who is watching could just mute their microphones, just to make it um, no extraneous noise in the background. Um, speak of you is often the best way to watch it, just in case it swamps the system. If you have any questions during the talks, can you use the chat function, which I'll be monitoring, and then I'll be reading those questions out to the speakers, it, that it doesn't cause um, distractions for, for either speaker. And if we can take questions about their talks at the end of each of their talks, if there's any general questions, then I'd suggest we have those at the end, because the, the discussion may broaden out, we'll see how it goes. Um, so in which case, thank you everybody for attending. Our first speaker, and we're delighted to try this um, with Dr. Professor Lyra Pantanovic from Ann Arbor in Michigan, USA. Um, it's, uh, I think, nine o'clock in the morning with him. So thank you very much for attending and contributing. Um, Lyra is a professor of department in, in Department of Pathology and Director of Anatomical Pathology, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He received his medical degree from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa and has worked in various other places en route to his current post. He's a completed a hematopathology fellowship at Harvard and cytopathology fellowship at Tufts, board certified pathologist, is editor in chief of the Journal of Pathology Informatics, past president and current council member of the Association of Pathology Informatics, president elect of the American Society of Cytopathology and a member of the Digital Pathology Association board of directors. He's widely published and hopefully a lot of you will have read some of his material in the past and we're delighted to have him as our first speaker today and hand over to yourself, Lauren, and thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you to the BAC for this invitation, and I'm really happy to be sharing this platform with Darren um, to talk about digital cytology. Hopefully you can uh, see my screen. So I'm gonna focus on digital cytology, and um, you know, it's, I'm not really talking specifically about the USA, but I will point out um, some of the work in the USA and the UK. Uh, I do have some disclosures. Uh, working in the in the world of pathology informatics, it's hard not to work with the industry. I'm on the advisory board and consult for certain companies, as shown on that slide. We have three objectives that Darren and I put together. The first two, I'm hoping that Darren will mostly cover, especially the RC path approach uh, to digital cytology, and I will focus on objective number three, which is um, there's a new digital cytology system that's uh, been put into the field by Hologic, and I'd like to share some experience that I've had with that particular system. So I will focus on objective number three. I thought I'd begin by summarizing the whole field of digital pathology from my perspective in, in one slide. Um, I've crossed out the word digital, um, although I'm an advocate for digital imaging, I think that uh, you know many people get hung up on digital pathology being this separate, novel, innovative, disruptive technology, and then are afraid to apply it to our field. Uh, it's just another tool for us to do pathology. So that's why I've crossed out the word digital. This is just pathology using digital tools like you would use a microscope, fish, IEC, or anything else. It's mature technology now. It's almost two decades since uh, vendors have provided us with these commercial scanners. Lots of software and hardware to pick from. We can mix and match basically anything that suits our labs. There's ample clinical and non-clinical applications. Uh, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can probably get any sort of validated article in the literature today, uh, both clinical and non-clinical. Most countries, both yours and mine in the USA, now have regulatory approval uh, to use this technology for diagnostic use. So not surprisingly, lots of interest, but global adoption is still slow, including here in the US. Uh, you know, many labs have a whole slide scanner, not too many of them are using it for diagnostic purposes. But when you do a gap analysis, digital cytology, uh, the needs for digital cytology to be used for diagnostic purposes uh, are still unmet, which is what I'd like to address in this particular part of the talk. The catalyst today is that digital pathology is well poised to start adopting artificial intelligence. As you've seen the hype around that, 
And even the vendors have started to shift towards making AI tools, including digital psychology AI tools. But the uh, experience with that is still limited. I will say though that many of us in cytology have had decades of experience with computer assisted screening with PAP tests. So there's lots of lessons to be learned there that can be applied to histopathology today. So if we move on, when labs say that they've gone digital or are going fully digital, the cytology piece still seems to be missing because for those labs that have gone fully digital in many European countries, Japan, uh, in Canada, and some of the private practices here in the US, when I ask them, what did they do with cytology? Well, they say that that part of, of their operation is not digitized and they still keep microscopes around for that. So how do we actually close that gap? The problem is that the whole site imaging technology we have today, it's been less pervasive in cytopathology because of the unique challenges. And for those of you who practice cytopathology, you know we have two main problems. One, the image acquisition problem. The current scanners make it hard to focus on our material. And two, our workflow is a little unique. We are required to screen and that you know, places some difficulties on having cytotex in the loop, and also trying to find rare cells using the current you know, ergonomic equipment like a computer mouse is not the best for us. The focus problems arise because of the material and it's unlikely we're gonna get rid of that. We have these 3D cell groups. We often have obscuring material like blood and mucus. And even though many of us may have adopted liquid-based cytology, thin prep sure path, for example, those monolayers still have three-dimensional cell clusters in them. So you still have to focus on those. And as a result, that warrants scanning these cytology slides with multiple focal planes. And the consequence of that is that you land up with very large files take a long size and, and the vendors haven't, not all the vendors have solved that to make it very practical to adopt in routine practice. As mentioned, when you have to screen a cytology slide, PAP slide, for example, just looking at it, for a couple of high grade cells. Uh, that's a tedious and time consuming task, just doing it on the glass slide. To do it on a computer mouse or with a computer mouse on a monitor is even more difficult. So we really need a dedicated digital cytology system to overcome all of these setbacks for us to go fully digital. This is an example of a pap smear from a woman who had a vaginal melanoma. You can see that this was scanned on a whole site scanner with just one Z plane. And while most of the melanoma cells in the background are in focus, the large cluster of melanoma cells are out of focus because we didn't scan it in this particular plane. And so that's the problem going forward, uh, you know, using current technology. Fortunately, the vendor Hologic, and I have no disclosure, nothing, no conflict of interest with Hologic, they have offered us a digital cytology system. This is currently in development. There are about two of those deployed in the USA. We have it here at the University of Michigan. We're validating it. And uh, Hologic told me they at least have 10 systems in the EU that people have started their validations. No one's completed their validations yet. The nice thing about this system is that it's optimized for cytology. It does volumetric scanning, which I'll explain shortly. But they've also coupled this with artificial intelligence. Now, Hologic had a simple machine learning algorithm to screen PAP tests uh, looking for squamous lesions. But the new generation of deep learning algorithms that they've incorporated allows, uh, allows us basically to not only have uh, you know, detection of squamous lesions, but glandular lesions, bugs, adequacy, and so forth. And while they've done a good job at doing this for PAP tests now, they've covered GYN cytology. I'm hopeful that they will open their system up for non-gynecological applications, that soon we will be able to, on this system, do CSF and all other effusions and uh, thyroid FNAs and so forth, and, and which will simplify the world of digital cytology for us. So it will combine digital cytology with artificial intelligence which opens up the world of computational cytology. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this new scanner, it's called the Genius Scanner. Uh, this is the scanner from Hologic. When you open it up, it can accommodate 400 slides. And then each of, the, each of these sort of carriers holds 40 slides. Uh, the carriers take two secure stain racks, 
of 20 slides each. And it does continuous loading. So you can take slides off while others are scanning. So this seems like a practical solution for labs, even if you have a high volume lab that you can scan 400 PAP test slides. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know the throughput yet, but you can scan 400 slides per batch. Now, what they've incorporated is volumetric scanning, which is very similar to Z stacking or multiple scanning. And Hologic have now, uh, when you put the thin prep slide in, it will scan 14 focal planes. So it captures all 14 planes uh, and it merges them all together. But what it does is it picks the best area with the best focus. So it represents the best optimal focus for a particular area and then puts that into the final merged image. So the end result is you have one flat image with all the best focus areas. It even includes all the 3D clusters that you can visualize. For example, there's a, a cluster of atypical glandular cells from an adenocarcinoma. Uh, and the cellular detail is, you know, is really superb. I've worked with it, I've, I found it amazing. Pathologists that have worked with it have asked me in my department if they could switch to doing PAPs this way as opposed to a microscope. So they have mastered this volumetric scanning, both image quality and the focus problem. The next thing they did was overcome the screening problem. So they will give you a computer monitor on which they display this gallery. And what you will see is on the left side is your gallery. These are your thumbnail images. And on the right is what is their cell spot or the, the thin prep circle, which will give you access to the whole side image. So the way it works is the AI algorithm will go and search uh, regions of interest and will display 24 images on the left. The images, the bottom row usually includes the glandular lesions. So if you're looking for endocervical uh, cells to determine if it's adequate or not, that will be on the bottom, including bugs. And then the lesional cells, squamous, glandular, or even bugs will be shown above that. If you click on a particular image, as you can see this dark area with low grade cells, I clicked on that. It automatically takes you to that exact location on the right, which is in the whole side image. And then you can go off and you can navigate. You can determine if this makes sense, you know, what else is in the neighborhood. And so you can put it into, into context in the whole slide, which is very helpful. And for the most part, you really only need these 24 images to look at to render a diagnosis. If you're not happy, you can continue to click and you can get delivered more images. This allows you to still incorporate the cytotechnologist in your workflow. So if a cytotechnologist got this case first, they would look at these thumbnails and they would click on the ones that they think are important. So if I clicked on that, if I was a cytotech, this image would drop to the bottom. And so, you know, if a cytotech clicked on three images, they would all drop to the bottom and then refer the case to the pathologist. So when a pathologist now logs in, I have the same view, the gallery on the left, the whole side image on the right, but I would also have the images at the bottom that a cytotech or a cytopathology fellow or resident had selected, in other words, sort of dotted or annotated for me to look at. So that's how this system is designed. Now, about uh, three years ago, Hologic presented this at one of the ASC, uh, American Society of Cytopathology meetings. Just their very preliminary findings. They used 50 PAP tests and they had a few cytotechs look at it. But even then, in the, in the early days of the development of the system, they reported some success. They reported one that using this digital review workstation um, reduced the amount of time it took for a cytotech to screen a case compared to the traditional manual review. And with these galleries of images, they were much more efficient. This did open a can of worms, and um, we will have to address this going forward, which is if cytotechs and cytopathologists now can review many more cases this way, will we have to? In other words, or will we be able to have a workload limit? This happened with the invention of liquid-based cytology, if some of you remember. When we moved from conventional smears to liquid-based PAPs, people complained that the, the, you know, the um, expectation of having to now screen many more PAPs in a day was you know, uh, dangerous and tiresome, and so they introduced workload limits. And I suspect that if a system like this, digital scientology with AI, uh, gets into more labs, that we will have to come up with new workload limits. 
but we'll have to say that, you know, my brain is just fried. I cannot do 300 paps uh, a day, even if, you know, you, you measure me from a time and motion study, I can. I just don't think that it's feasible. So that was only 50 cases. And uh, I wanted to know if, uh, what was the experience with many people using this? So I worked with Sarah Harrington. Sarah Harrington is part of the R&D team at Hologic. I uh, wasn't funded for the study um, and they didn't provide any funding either. So this was just an educational uh, academic exercise. And what we wanted to do was uh, use an educational website, which Hologic launched. And this is the link. Uh, if you want to, you can go to that link. Uh, I would recommend if you think that you're going to get one of these systems to sign up, register, you will be anonymous in the system. And you, will, you every week you can get 10 digital PAP test cases sent to you and you can try them on this digital system. So we had done this, and, and after about 12, 13 months, we analyzed the data of people looking at the system. So the way we actually conducted this particular study was, we received thin prep slides. These slides were donated from uh, reference labs in the USA. They were scanned at 40X on the system. That's 0.25 microns. That's sort of standard for most uh, scanners. And it used this new volumetric focal plane scanning. All the cases came with cytology diagnoses made by pathologists. Uh, sometimes there was also a follow-up uh, cervix biopsy uh, diagnosis to accompany that for histopathology. And all these diagnoses were uh, verified by two uh, very senior cytotechs. The slides were then analyzed using this artificial intelligence-based algorithm, which detected the following. It looked for the presence of end of the cervical cells for adequacy. Using the Bethesda system, it looked for squamous and glandular lesions, and it looked for several microorganisms, candida, uh, herpes, and so forth. On the website, which was hosted on Amazon Web Services, people could access this gallery, those 24 images, as well as the whole site image of the cell spot. And before the cases were released for public uh, consumption, we had 15 cytotechs check all the diagnoses and make sure that there was a consensus so that no one argued that an ASCUS wasn't an ASCUS or a low grade wasn't a low grade. And then the users were asked to at least use a high definition monitor and a high speed internet connectivity. And we let people look at this for 13 months and we recorded their diagnoses, how long they took looking at these cases and what they clicked on, where they clicked on to get to a diagnosis. We unfortunately didn't capture too much information about the people taking this, like we knew they were cytotechs or pathologists, but we didn't know how many years they were in practice, et cetera, because this was anonymous. We, uh, we, we, we didn't force people to enter personal information. So this is, if you logged onto the website and you got a case, this is what it looked like, very similar to the ones I've explained. This is a case of herpes. Um, you know, if you clicked on that image, you'll see that these are the uh, Cowdery B, uh, you know, inclusions of herpes in a pap. Then the, the user would, uh, was given a, a view like this to determine if it was at, if there was in the cervical cells for adequacy, absent or present. According to the Bethesda system, they would pick a diagnosis. In this case, herpes would be negative. Um, if they saw any organisms, they could pick herpes, for example. And then before they exited the case, they were actually given the correct answer. They were told what there was. There was trick as well as herpes and they were given some diagnostic images as an educational exercise. So people enjoy doing this. And this is what we found after 13 months. So a lot of people enrolled. We had over 51,000 people. Um, uh, so we had over 51,000 cases reviewed by 918 people. Lots of cytotechs, some pathologists, other lab personnel like trainees, uh, fellows, you know, looked at these cases. The vast majority, 81.5% of the people that did this were cytotechs, fewer pathologists, and there were people from all around the world that actually took this test. Uh, and that's one limitation because we did, the, the system is designed around the Bethesda system. Uh, and also you had to be somewhat proficient in English. So for people in some countries that don't use the Bethesda system or have difficulty with English uh, not being their first language, that could have influenced results. Most of the people were able to complete looking at a PASME in under two minutes, which was pretty good. The cytotechs were quicker, 65 seconds for a cytotech to read a PAP 
than a pathologist. It took about 82 seconds to review a PAP. That was significant. Obviously, it makes sense that low grade, which is easy to identify, those were the quickest cases to review. For a low grade case, it takes uh, someone only 52 seconds to review a PAP this way. Longer times were associated with incorrect diagnoses. In other words, if someone didn't know what they were really looking at, they clicked around and, you know, and, and navigated the whole side image to figure it out. And also for organisms, people spent more time when they found bugs, probably going to the whole side image and navigating to see if they were real and uh, you know, did, was the background milieu uh, compatible with the findings. The Cytotex, when we compared what their diagnoses were to the original reference diagnosis, the Cytotex were a little bit better than the pathologists. I will tell you that we had difficulty getting this paper published because it was peer reviewed by cytopathologists and they all were very sticky about this point. Asking me why were cytotex better than pathologists? Well, you can go and read the paper, but I don't want to speculate too much, but you know, cytotex are probably, uh, you know, have more experience at PAPS than pathologists. They spend more time screening. And in this particular setting, which is an educational setting and not a true clinical setting, uh, it, that may account for why the Cytotex did better than the pathologists. What was interesting to us is that in 62% of the cases, that's almost two thirds of the cases, Cytotex and Cytopathologists didn't have to go to the whole site image. That the AI, the AI thumbnails presented were good enough to get a diagnosis and, and, and almost 92% of the time, just looking at, you know, like. 24 snapshots was good enough to get the right diagnosis on a case. Pathologists did tend to click around more than cytotex. And as I mentioned, the more you click around, it probably means that you're not certain about the case. And so the diagnostic accuracy went down the more you click around. There were several tables from the study. This is just one table to show you, um, you know, what kind of data was produced by looking at all these cases. Uh, the columns here basically show this is the diagnostic match from the diagnosis given on the digital PAP to the original diagnosis. And you can see in the negative category, Cytotex were a little bit better than pathologists. In the ASCUS low grade category, again, Cytotex were a little bit better than pathologists. And then for ASCH and above all the way to cancer cases, uh, Cytotex were marginally better than pathologists. So overall, Cytotex did better with digital PAPs than pathologists did for this particular study. So these are the conclusions that we can draw from you know, looking at these 50,000 um, digital PAPs by almost 100 people, uh, yeah, almost, almost 1,000 people. What was helpful was that this website allowed us to at least gain some feedback from cytologists out there, how they interact with the digital PAP. You know, what, are the consequences of us moving from a microscope-based screening system, even though we have some image analysis to assist to a completely digital cytology system, where you're now looking at everything on a monitor, no microscope, and you have AI doing all the screening and presenting you the most representative fields. So, um, you know, this really shows that this is feasible and something that we can adopt in clinical practice. This is not a study that validates the accuracy of the hologic system in a clinical setting. As I mentioned, that's being done, for example, there are 10 labs in the EU now that are doing that, actually looking at true validation in a clinical setting. But the data suggests that the digital PAP test review, when you have the image display on the left and the whole site image on the right, it's really very quick and easy to do. I don't think we should be afraid and we should therefore embrace it. I do give kudos and commend Hologic for developing a system designed specifically for us as cytopathologists, because the high diagnostic concordance in these 50,000 PAPs, uh, the reason we, we, reason we observed a high concordance with the original reference diagnosis was attributed to three reasons. One, this new system really produces high image quality with this volumetric scanning. So they've nailed it. They solved the problem of, of focusing uh, for cytology material. Two, the image gallery format that they provide, where the AI feeds these images to us, that overcomes the screening problem that we've had using a mouse, for example. And finally, still giving us cytologists access to the whole site image 
to still, uh, you know, add the art and the science to the diagnosis, to go and look around yourself, confirm it, uh, allows us to kind of navigate and, uh, you know, sort of feel that we, we're still in charge and control of the case. So it's not that AI is replacing us, that we're working together with the AI to augment what we do. And that's really my take home message um, to, to all of you. Uh, and what I really believe is that, uh, that a system like this new digital cytology system is not really meant to replace us. But if we work together with that digital cytology system, I bet that uh, it will be better than just cytologists who stick to the old manual review of, uh, you know, slides and a microscope. Uh, we have to see how that pans out, but um, you know, I anticipate good results uh, from these validation studies in the EU. So again, thank you, Paul and the BAC for inviting me and allowing me to share uh, the study with you. And I'm happy to address any of your questions now or uh, even at the end of the talk. Paul, I'll hand over back to you. Super. No, thank you very much, Lauren, for a very interesting talk. Um, it's fascinating to see the data. Um, I, I, there's a couple of questions from the chat function, but I think one of the ones I just want to ask is the whole slide is scanned. So does this system allow you to have the glass slide available as well? Because I know that some systems sort of will move the stage for you to allow you to go to the same coordinates. Well, the system is designed for you not to be in the same location as the slide. Right. So the slide could be scanned here in Michigan and you can be reading it in, in the UK. Uh, of course, if you want uh, to defer to the slide for some reason, it's out of focus, it's a weird slide, the slide got cracked or broken and you, you still need to use it yeah. and the system then cannot do it, I think you can defer to a microscope. So they yeah. still actually make a physical slide and they don't trash and discard it. So it is available yeah. if you need to refer to it. Okay, okay, no, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions come in from the chat function, which I'll just ask. Uh, one is, isn't this just PatNet the resurrection? Some of us with memories can remember the PAPnet system, and this feels similar. Yeah, it's exactly that, except that now, <laughs> it's, now they've, they've, you know, uh, have better technology for the imaging component, uh, so that's great. And two, they've gone from simple machine learning to now deep learning, so the AI is way better. So we're not mm -hmm. just relying on looking for the squamous component. Now, which is something people always argued, well, you know, well, we shouldn't just rely on the squamous component. What if we miss endometrial adenocarcinoma, a rare fallopian yeah. carcinoma? Now the AI can incorporate all of that. So, yeah, it's uh, the old path net on steroids. Yeah. Um, two sort of technical questions. One is, um, was there a system-specific stain used on this, or is this just an ordinary PAP stain? No, we... Uh, they, they, a logic um, will require you to use a, a a proprietary stain with their reagent to work with this. So we've had to revalidate the stain, um, I guess, so that uh, the AI is based on a particular, you know, slide prep with stain. And so the question is, yes, you will have to use the right reagent to match this digital system. Right. Okay. Uh, another question. On the volumetric scanning, what's the distance between each Z-stack layer that allows you to get this integrated single focus image? They won't tell me that. <laughs> I can't share that. So some of that's proprietary. Okay. Um, published literature, though, you know, on PAPs and how much distance you should have. So people have written papers on that, um, looking at sure path thin prep. And the recommendation in the literature is 0.5 microns between a Z-stack. But a logic wouldn't tell me what distance uh, they have between their scans. Okay. Um, I expect it's 0.5 if they followed the literature, but I don't know. Okay. Um, one question was around the, was their experience or years of training significant for the cytotechnologist and pathologist in the study, i.e. did years of cytology, I suspect, suggest a difference in their outcomes? Unfortunately, that's a limitation is because this was an anonymous study and we didn't force people to um, fill out que the questionnaire with all this kind of detail. We did not know years of experience in cytology practice. And we did also did not know years of experience with using digital imaging, both of which could improve your performance. So that we don't know. Yeah. And then uh, two questions which are similar. Um, what is our non gyne algorithms being developed? Uh, this is obviously for pap smears for cervical, but are there non-GANI ones being developed? Do you know? So um, 
Yes, you know, uh, well, there's one, are they being developed by this vendor and are they being developed by other people? So the, the answer is, I have rumors that this vendor are developing other algorithms, but again, it's, uh, you know, under wraps. So I don't know the true answer to this. Uh, if they yeah. will um, be adding future apps like urine, thyroid, and so forth. But many other people and other vendors are working on cytology apps for all those other applications. Yeah. I will uh, tell you one thing, Paul, that's there's no reason why you also cannot put on a, a histology slide onto the scanner, right? So they are not saying that you cannot do that. Um, we haven't done it. Um, I don't know if anyone has yet. But that may change the, the ball game because many people also complain uh, about some histopathology slides not being in focus, tissue folds, frozen sections. If you put a histology slide on, yeah, and had volumetric scanning, you know, super high yeah. resolution, great focus, super quick, maybe that will the scanner could also be used for histopathology. But this that will be up to her logic, the vendor, to permit that. Yeah. And, and two last questions because I don't want to run into Darren's time. Um, do you know roughly what the file size and how long it takes to scan each slide? I do not know the file size. Um, I know that they do use compression, um, but uh, I'm told it's somewhere under a minute for a slide. Okay. And one last question is, you mentioned about increased productivity potentially. And did, was, is that actually seen? Although this is an educational um, approach, you're talking about increased productivity. Uh, somebody's asked, do you have a uh, proposed break-even point with efficiencies versus cost? That may be a bit uh, too uh, managerial. I don't have that, but I'm maybe <laughs> one of these 10 labs in the EU. Uh, I'm even told somewhere in the UK, if someone's using the system, maybe they will do those studies. Uh, maybe Darren is aware of someone doing that study. Um, Darren does those studies quite well, uh, those break-even points. So I don't know, not, not with this study, and I don't know who... Okay. Okay, thanks. And one very last question. I've been lying. So one last question that's just popped in. Has, it been, has this system been tried on non-hologic stained, i.e. conventional PAP stain, just to see how that works to build up a teaching library? I know that the vendor has done that, but I don't know of any labs that have the system are doing that. Right. Okay. No, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's obviously generated a lot of very specific questions there. So thank you. Um, and if we move into Darren's talk, there may be other ones to pick up on, but thank you.